So this is a special topic that's just been included for fundamentals of physics. In this topic, we're going to be looking at electric potential and at equipotential surfaces. So we're doing this because you need to know a bit about these concepts for your first in-lab experiment in which you'll be looking at how to plot out electrostatic fields. So we've seen Coulomb's law, which can be written as F is equal to K Q1 Q2 on R squared. This tells us about the force between two particles with charges Q1 and Q2, which is separated by a distance R. Now, I want you to visualize a specific example now. We'll have a point charge with a really large charge on it, which we'll represent by a capital Q, and we're going to imagine a another point charge with a much, much smaller charge on it. So we'll represent this by lowercase q. In this case, the force between these two charged particles is given by F is equal to K Q Q on R squared. Now fields are actually a really useful way to visualize many things in physics. So a field is just anything that has a value at each point in space and time. So for example, if you imagine a temperature map of the Earth, say we plotted out the temperature at each point on the Earth's surface, and then we did that going through time so we could see how the temperature was changing, this would be an example of a field, a temperature field in this case. So an electric field is actually a really useful way to visualize the force on a charged particle. So in our example, we can imagine the large charge, capital Q, creating a field which the smaller Q then experiences. So of course, the smaller charge will also create an electric field as it's exerting a force on the large charge as well. But it turns out this, this electric field is actually much, much smaller because it has a lot less charge. But we'll see why that is in just a second. So electric fields are actually defined as the force on a test particle per unit charge. So as an equation, we can write E is equal to F divided by Q. So we're just dividing the force felt by the charge on our test particle. So in our example, we're imagining the field as created by the large Q and that the smaller Q is our test particle that we're using to map out that field. So substituting into this equation, our expression for F, we can see that E is going to equal to KQQ divided by R squared Q, and then the lowercase Qs will cancel out, so this becomes KQ on R squared. Now, if we have this, if lowercase Q is positive, we know that the force is going to be away from large Q. So the direction of the field is away from the positive charge. So it's actually useful to draw this out. We can draw the electric field lines in this situation like this. So you can see that the test particle is always going to feel the force away from that large charge Q. Now when we plot out electric field lines, the direction of the lines shows the direction of the force on a positive particle, and the density of the lines shows how strong the electric field is. So you can see that close to our point charge Q, the lines are much closer together. So this is indicating that we've got a much stronger electric field there. When we move away from this test particle, the lines are much more spaced out and have a much lower density, indicating that our electric field is a lot weaker out there. Now another interesting situation where we can draw electric field lines is imagine we have a plate which has positive charges evenly distributed along it, and then below that we've got another plate with negative charges distributed along this. Now, if we imagine putting a test charge between these plates, they're going to feel a force, if it's a positive test charge, down towards the negative plate. So that tells us the direction of the electric field. It actually turns out that the electric field between plates like this is constant throughout that. So we can represent the field lines like this. You can see that the spacing between the field lines remains the same because the electric field strength is not changing. So when we move a charged particle in an electric field, we can actually change its energy. 
So let's think of an analogy for this, which you'd be more familiar with. You'd be aware that there's a gravitational field all around you. You know that because you feel a force down towards the center of the Earth, and we can represent this force by a field. So the gravitational field is going down towards the center of the Earth. Now, if I imagine lifting up a ball, I'm actually giving the ball energy by lifting it up. How do I know I've given the energy? Well, if I let go, the ball is going to drop back down to the Earth. And how could it start moving if it didn't have any energy? So with our electric field, consider again our large charge Q and our smaller charge little Q. If we move little Q towards big Q, it's then experiencing a much stronger electric field. And if we let go and no longer hold it there, it's going to fly away from big Q. So by moving it closer to big Q, we've actually given it some stored energy, which is actually known as potential energy. So you've probably heard of voltage in regards to circuits before. Another way of saying voltage is electric potential. These two words mean the same thing. So the electric potential is actually related to the electric potential energy through the equation, the change in potential is equal to the change in potential energy divided by Q. So we can write this as delta V is equal to delta U divided by Q. So in this case, the delta represents a change. V is our voltage. U is the symbol that we usually use to represent potential energy. And Q is the charge on that little test particle. So what this formula is telling us is that the change in potential is just equal to the change in potential energy per unit charge. Now, batteries, which you would be familiar with, supply a constant voltage until they've just charged, obviously. So this provides energy to move the electrons around the circuit. So this energy establishes the electric current which flows through our circuits. Now, there is a relationship between electric potential and electric fields, which really makes sense because we said when we moved that charged particle against the electric field, we were storing energy in it. So we were giving it potential energy. So it turns out that we can write an expression for the potential around a point charge, such as our point charge capital Q here. In this case, we can describe the potential through the equation V is equal to KQ on R. Now, as you'll see from that equation, every point around our point charge at the same radius is going to have the same voltage or electric potential. So in this case, around a point charge, we've got equipotential surfaces, which are spheres. So an equipotential surface is a surface on which all points have the same voltage. So it's much like dot, joining the dots. If you join all the dots, which have the same value of V, you end up with an equipotential surface. Now, if we imagine our other example with the two charged plates where we had a constant electric field between the plates, then the voltage in this case is described by the equation V is equal to ED, where D is the distance from the negative plate. So in this case, any points at the same distance, so any points which are forming our horizontal line there parallel to our plates are going to be on an equipotential surface as they are all at the same voltage.